Fans of the channel will know that last Christmas I got a 3950X and I got this with an Asus Impact motherboard, a PCIe 4.0 solid state drive, liquid cooling, and a low profile power supply. I repurposed a lot of my old parts like the existing SATA solid state drives that I put in RAID for storage and I've been having a good time. Go. But the fact of the matter is, where is my review? I haven't just been playing with dogs. I've been making all of these videos for you guys, and that's the point. I didn't get a 3950X to rush out a review before everyone else, even though I certainly could have. No, I got this processor to make videos, videos for you all. I actually use this processor. And as you can probably tell, I have been doing that avidly December through January, but now it's February, and the fact of the matter is I just gotta get this thing out. So that's what this review will be. My thoughts, my recommendations, what I think after two months of having the 3950X, two months of going from a 6700K to quadruple the cores on a 3950X. But I have to, I have to start with gaming performance. So let's just run through what hardware unbox results were very quickly. And I'm actually gonna pull the majority of the results you're about to see from an interesting comparison done by Hardware Unbox between the 3950X and the 9900KS using tuned memory. The reason I do this is I actually use 3600CL14 memory for my 3950X. So it's frankly a good comparison to the results I've been seeing lately. And additionally, I think it's only fair if we're gonna talk about gaming performance that we show Intel in its best light in AMD and their best light. And in AMD's best light, you use tuned memory. Now there would be those that say it's unfair for me to use more expensive memory when it benefits AMD more. They might say that's unrealistic for gaming builds, but the fact of the matter is the 9900KS is currently selling for, well, outlandish prices. And even when it came out, I remember it was about $700. And additionally, with any 9900, whether it's a K or a KS, you will need to use a more expensive cooling solution. You can frankly just use a normal air cooler with a 3950X, as you will see. And you also need a more expensive power supply. I used a low profile one for mine because frankly, the thing just doesn't use a lot of energy. So in other words, what I'm saying is the only way you're gonna get a 9900K to really claim any performance wins over Ryzen is if you're spending a bunch of extra money on cooling anyways, because it's stock, it really just doesn't do anything. And so if we look at both of these processors, Intel's best mainstream processor and AMD's best mainstream processor, we see they are neck and neck. They are basically exactly the same gaming performance, which was my point when I made the video responding to the early reviews saying the 3950X is basically a Threadripper processor for cheaper and a 9900K gaming experience at the same time. But forget these expensive processors for gaming because the overall point I'm making by rushing through these gaming benchmarks is this. If you look at the 3800X, which I've always said is the most you should ever spend on a gaming processor if your rig is predominantly for gaming, is about 10% away from a 9900K at most. And in most games, it's a couple frames per second, if that. And that's my overall point. Whether we are talking about, you know, the supposedly bad at gaming, even second gen Threadripper processors, or outlandish 200 watt stupid things coming out of Intel right now, all of these processors basically game the same. No one should be spending another $200 on an Intel i9 over an 3800X for gaming. It is my opinion, you're an idiot or you have been misled if you do that. These processors all perform the same. The same in gaming. And I don't want to harp about this too much longer, but I will give some final thoughts about what it was like when I upgraded, right? I went from a slightly overclocked 6700K to a 3950X. Quadruple the cores, you know, basically I had a 7700K. And what was the difference? Honestly, 
in most games, it wasn't that big. I think overall, I saw a pretty consistent 10 to 20% increase, but there were a decent amount of games I play where I didn't notice anything between an overclock 6700K and a 3950X. And that's why I have to harp on the 3800X point and every all these other processors. Whether you have a 2700X or a liquid-cooled 9900KS, everything in between that is better than what we had five years ago. It's all good at gaming. However, I will be clear about one thing. There were times where there was a massive difference. Actually, in-game, in frenetic battles, keep in mind, outside of canned benchmarks, I noticed some huge differences in the Division 2. I never really saw my frame rate when I uncapped it go above I don't know, 150 frames per second with the 7700K equivalent. But the 3950X, I would see it spike up to 200 frames all the time. And it went from like a 120 hertz minimum frame rate to like a 144 hertz minimum. It never drops below 144 anymore. And in Battlefield 5, I would say there was a clear 20 to 30% increase in minimums. And keep in mind, this is while doing rendering 20 chrome tabs and other things at the same time as gaming so there were some recent games where the uplift was massive even while doing a bunch of other things at the same time and you know i guess other thoughts deus ex mankind divided i booted up a save in direct x12 and that felt smoother than i've ever seen again i pretty much would usually cap the frame rate around 76 to 90 but with a 3950x it seemed like you could legitimately just game above 100 again in actual in game in the can benchmark there wasn't that much of a difference and one more interesting thing was mountain blade warband i've been playing a mod of that you know 300 people uh on screen it definitely felt like the minimums were a bit higher than before. You know, they would sometimes drop to about 100, but that almost never happened anymore. The most I ever saw was dropping 220. So even with this weird old game, if I had mods and a ton of people on screen, it seemed to be more consistent. So as more games come out in DirectX 12 and Vulkan, I actually do expect Zen 2, especially the high core count models, to pull ahead more and more these old, outdated Intel architectures. But I just got to harp about this. No one should be buying this for better gaming, at least not over, I guess, something as strong or stronger than a 7700k don't get me wrong there were some games like the division 2 and battlefield 5 where there was a notable 20 30 percent increase not everyone plays the same games i do so I, I just really do have to stress this that it's not as consistent as you would think and there were some games like um i don't know ghost recon wildlands where i think there was actually a slight regression in performance again anything above a 7700k games well Oh, and just let me show this one more time. This is a bunch of Chrome tabs open, a Bitcoin node running at the same time, and rendering. And I used to sometimes render or try to sync a Bitcoin core node while playing Battlefield Online, and there would be big lag spikes, and it would be capped at about, I don't know... 70 hertz at most and it would drop below 60 sometimes while gaming and with this it was 90 to 100 hertz with zero spikes just smooth 100 hertz gaming well rendering and running a bitcoin node at the same time this is completely uncapped performance and so that's who the 3950x is really for people who don't want to sacrifice anything anything Another thing I want to touch on quickly is overclocking. What was my experience? And, and actually, specifically, I want to start with per CCX overclocking. That's something you can do, right? So each core chiplet has two CCXs, right? So there's two eight-core chiplets, and each eight-core chiplet has two CCXs. There's four CCXs total. And yes, you can overclock eat the multiplier of each of the four CCXs separately. And that may sound like a tempting thing to do, for tweakers. I've seen many people in my Discord who have a 3600X say, oh, that'd be so interesting to see if you could get one of those CCXs to, I don't know, 4.6 gigahertz, another one to 4.4, and then the rest maybe just at 3.8 gigahertz, but those are the background task cores anyway, so who cares? 
it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all to do per CCX overclocking to mess with the actual, you know, all core turbo. That's what Hardware Unbox found, and I could not concur more. You have to massively crank up voltage and power usage to do this. And honestly, at stock settings, the thing was boosting all cores to 4.2 gigahertz most of the time anyways. Or if I looked at per core multipliers, well, I don't know, running Prime 95 or something, I would notice that generally speaking, half of the cores were 4.2 and the other half were between 3.8 and 4. And then when I was playing Battlefield 5, again, this is at stock, one or two of the cores would boost to 4.5 gigahertz, sometimes even to 4.6 or 4.7 for a split second, and the rest of the cores would be between 4 and 4.3 gigahertz. But remember, Battlefield 5 only uses 12 threads, so it's like, yeah, of those 12 threads, two of them are clocked really fast and the rest are at like 4.3 gigahertz at stock. There's really no benefit then for me doing all core turbo overclocking unless I can get all cores to be boosting at the same time to, I would say, at least 4.3 gigahertz. You see why? Because some of them are already going to 4.5. So if I'm going to sacrifice the top turbo of two of the, one or two of the cores, all of them better be at 4.3 to get a net benefit. And that's just not what happened. Again, I had to massively crank up voltage to barely get to what seemed like 4.2 gigahertz. What I settled on is negative 0 0.09375 volts. You know, mil or yeah. In, in other words, I did a very slight undervolt to where I didn't get a performance loss. And there's people who would say, oh, you're going to mess with the boosted algorithm. You'll lose performance. Guys, I ran benchmarks. I stopped a little short of where I lost performance. I actually gained performance slightly with negative 0 0.09375 voltage offset what i'm saying is my recommendation for 99 percent of people if they want to overclock their 3950x and to be clear you don't need to it's fine at stock settings it boosts the boosting algorithm with zen 2 is insanely impressive what i recommend you do is just go to like negative 0 0.05 voltage offset you know some of you will be able to get to point you know, 0.1, maybe even 0.12 if you have a golden sample without losing performance. But that wasn't mine. I just say that. Go to negative 0.05 voltage offset, turn on precision boost overdrive, and then set the scaler to times six. And I've seen other people say around times four to times eight work for them. I'm just going to say times six. If you do that, you're lowering voltage slightly. It should be able to, because it's going to slightly lower temperatures, boost higher for longer. And because precision boost overdrive is on with time six, it'll be more aggressive and overclocking some of the cores. And keep in mind, increasing the scalar increases how much voltage it's allowed to apply to like each individual core when it's opportunistically boosting. Meaning even though it's undervolted, using less energy, generally speaking, getting less hot, when it needs to boost one of the cores higher, that time six scaler will let that use more voltage than my offset. It counteracts my offset. Does this all make sense, right? What I'm saying is less heat, less power usage, so it can boost higher longer. That's why I undervolted it. And then I did the time six scaler increase so that it can de facto override that undervolt for the cores it wants to boost to 4.7 gigahertz. I don't know how else to explain it. I think that makes sense, and that is my recommendation. So there was an introduction. There was an overview of what the general gaming performance should be for most people. Then I even dove into my personal anecdotal experiences a bit and then gave some overclocking advice. At that point then, I think we're in final thoughts. And I guess the question then is, I've had it for two months. I was one of the first people to get it, even though I didn't do a review before a bunch of other people like I probably should have. What has it been like, though, for two months owning this 3950X? You know, 10 years ago, eight threads was crazy overkill. It was enough for having a web browser open, a AAA game open, and encoding on a handbrake at the same time without feeling lag. But that was a decade ago. And since then, there's been this slow moving coup of needing more cores that was always going to catch up with Intel and anyone else, including AMD, if they didn't get more threads out there. And so it's kind of back to even before the glory days of when eight threads was enough 
or should I say when eight threads was overkill. We're back to where my PC is a well of performance that I can pull from to do whatever I want to creatively. Do I want to, you know, render a video while doing research for the next video and uploading another video at the same time? Sure. If I'm playing Battlefield 5 with my brother Dan and I realize, oh, let me back up this hard drive or move, you know, 100 gigabytes of information between two drives, I can do that. The Gen 4 SSD has enough bandwidth where it can load Battlefield 5 faster than anyone else and moving 100 gigabytes between that drive and something else at the same time doesn't slow it down. And having the 32 threads means I can do literally dozens of things at once without noticing a hitch. There is no more compromises. That's what the 3950X allows me to do. Everything is fast, and everything can be done at the same time fast. Now, if you're a professional who needs to render on 48 threads or more, I would say pay up for Threadripper. But for everyone else who does semi-professional or creative stuff, 3950X is overkill, and it's cheaper than what Threadripper used to be. And I love it. It's great. I really can't say enough good things. I mean, I'm trying to think of what else to add to this review. I guess I would say I have that Arctic 280 millimeter uh, all-in-one liquid cooler. It's idling at 25 Celsius, and while gaming, it's below 60. That's how little energy this thing uses. It's absolutely hilarious how efficient these 16 cores are. This isn't like, you know, a 180 watt or 280 watt Threadripper. This isn't, you know, some Intel HEDT or even mainstream chip that's screaming at 150 watts or more at 90 degrees Celsius. It's running cool. It's running quiet. My PC is cool as a cucumber, and it's doing all of this better than anything I've seen before. It is absolutely incredible. I don't think this was really a rushed review, but it's not as comprehensive as like what Hardware Unboxed would do, or maybe even as much as my Radeon 7 review. So, but at the same time, I just received more insider information on Intel, on AMD, and I've got two more scripts. Oh yeah, and I got information on the PlayStation 5 that I just haven't been able to get to. I just had to get this video out. In other words, what I'm saying is if you have follow-up questions, if you support me on Patreon, you can submit reader mail and i'll answer your questions on the next broken silicon that i have with dan or on the next loose ends and until then hope you enjoyed this video please share it it helps so much and if you like my content well there's a new dive shrink out support me on Patreon. all right thank you